Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here, and I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak to our patients and caregivers and healthcare professionals, everybody who is interested in management of facial pain. The, um, the neuromodulation is a fascinating part of uh, our armamentarium. You know, the neuromodulation in general, and you can define it in many different ways, um, uh, from very basic to very scientific, but in general, it refers to our um, uh, approach uh, to management uh, of a variety of neurological condition uh, with uh, non-destructive um, uh, change in the neural activity. So whenever we try to uh, modulate, or which means either very uh, strongly activate or inhibit um, uh, nervous tissue without actually destroying it, that probably refers to neuromodulation. And neuromodulation can be done in a variety of different ways. The most common one is electrical neuromodulation. When people talk about stimulation, stimulating the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, the face, they, uh, that's electrical neuromodulation. It can also be done chemically. There's chemical neuromodulation. It can be even done genetically. There are very different ways to uh, change the activity of the neural function uh, without uh, destroying the tissue. So neuromodulation is a fascinating and rapidly growing field, and, and it's something that we now use in treatment of facial pain as well. So what you're saying is if I take a pill, say uh, Neurontin, I am doing neuromodulation by taking that chemical. Same thing, right? Yes. The, in, interestingly enough, if you do this through an implanted device or any kind of device that is intended for this, then it may be considered neuromodulation. So whenever we put pump in the patient that will deliver a medication around the clock, and it can be done with morphine or baclofen or maybe eventually neurontin, then uh, that they will be considered neuromodulation. Taking pills by mouth probably will not. This is uh, just a pharmaceutical management. Neuromodulation refers to uh, our use of dedicated devices. And those devices can be either implanted or non-implanted, so it can be invasive or non-invasive neuromodulation, but the use of uh, appropriate device is kind of assumed a part of it. So how can you use these devices in people, in people with facial pain? How do they do that? Interestingly enough, the neuromodulation has been used for very many indications. You know, people heard about brain stimulation for Parkinson's and for epilepsy and for psychiatric conditions, but traditionally pain has been a very large um, uh, part of neuromodulation spectrum. And, the, uh, and, and the, judging purely by numbers, the pain is by far the largest indication for neuromodulation. And among the pain indications, most people get neuromodulation devices used for treatment of back pain or uh, failed back surgery syndrome or a variety of uh, neuropathic conditions uh, in the body. The face is relatively um, uh, uh, less commonly used um, uh, indication. So facial pain is something that we see a rapid uh, increase in publications and general scientific and clinical interest, but it has not been a classical indication for neuromodulation. So what, what we're doing now is trying to kind of raise the interest to this, raise awareness of different modalities, and hopefully um, uh, bring up some scientific value and, uh, and evidence to our, our treatments. So before we get into how it works, what would be an example of a, use the word classic or typical kind of patient who might be a candidate for such a thing? Well, it's very interesting that uh, the, um, the question of indications has consistently come up in uh, discussion of neuromodulation because people try to, to use it for a variety of different things. And early on, uh, the first indication, not surprisingly, was actually typical trigeminal neurology. And people realized that by stimulating or modulating the nerves, they can make the pain worse. And, uh, and therefore, neuromodulation has not become mainstream approach for treatment of typical trigeminal neurology. You mean, However, experience with other indications... Severe stabbing, intermittent, tick de la rue, not neuromodulation. Correct, correct. And thankfully for that, we have other approaches, including microvascular decompression, radio frequency ganglialysis, balloon compression, glycerol, radio surgery. Those are indications for trigeminal neurology. But the experience in other parts of the body show that neuromodulation seems to be most effective for what's called neuropathic pain, pain of more of the constant burning, uh, unpleasant, um, uh, nature, which happens from dysfunction of the nervous system. So in the face, that condition would be something like trigeminal neuropathic pain. So non-neurologic condition, when the pain is mostly constant, when there's some damage to the nerve underneath, either from trauma or from 
surgery, or even post herpetic neurology, which is another example of neuropathic pain, or Single. pain that happens in patients with trigeminal neurology after the treatment, when the neurologic pain is controlled, but they continue to have this con constant neuropathic unpleasant pain from the dysfunction of the nervous system. So that's considered probably more um, uh, acceptable indication for neuromodulation. So it's used for neuropathic facial pain that is what I term dysesthetic, meaning it's constant with odd burning electrical constant tingling feelings that don't stop. They're not intermittent. They're, they're, this is, they can be worse this than that, but they're not intermittent. Not every neuropathic pain has the aesthetic component, but definitely it, the anesthesia is one of the one of the big parts of it. And um, uh, it doesn't have to be completely constant, but it's more of the um, uh, kind of continuing pain. So as opposed to sharp and shooting pain of typical trigeminal neurology, for which neuromodulation may not necessarily work or actually can make it worse. So, but neuropathic pain, when, when you and I examine the patient, we can probably come up with diagnosis pretty rapidly, but may not necessarily be very obvious to, uh, to a lot of other healthcare practitioners, because I see a lot of patients refer to me for treatment of trigeminal neuralgia when in fact they have neuropathic pain. And for those patients, the classical interventions that we talk about probably not gonna be a good option. So for those patients, neuromodulation can be considered as one of the early interventions because that seems to work better. And um, at the same time, it's an alternative to all kinds of destructive surgeries because before neuromodulation became available 40, 50 years ago, the people would treat neuropathic pain with ablative surgery by cutting the nerves, by cutting the trigeminal ganglion, trigeminal root, trigeminal nucleus, or even any something in the brain. But, but yeah. these days, uh, we try to, uh, we prefer neuromodulation as a much less uh, traumatic and less, less invasive uh, uh, approach to treat neuropathic pain. So that's key. It's it's minimally invasive. Yes, it, it usually is. I mean, there's some examples, and I'm sure we'll touch upon them uh, during our conversation today. Some are more invasive than others. So when we stimulate deep structures of the brain, it becomes more invasive. But peripheral neurostimulation, when we put uh, electrodes over the nerves in the face or um, uh, over the main, main trunks of these nerves, it's still much less invasive than any type of uh, destructive surgery. So let's talk about this thing called peripheral stimulation for facial pain. Give me an example, or I could give you an example. You give me an example of someone who would be a good candidate for that. Absolutely. The, uh, the, 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 the peripheral neurostimulation essentially uh, entails placement of electrode in the vicinity of the nerve. So we find the nerve that they, we have, feel is responsible for this type of neuropathic pain, and then we stimulate the nerve. And stimulating it means we put electrical device in the vicinity of the nerve, which emits electricity. So there are electrical field that kind of catches or wraps around the nerve. And that electrical field delivers stimulation to the nerve itself. Different frequency of stimulation will produce different effects. But in general, our goal is to um, control the pain by eliciting paresthesias. So we, we elicit a non-painful sensation, and that non-painful sensation tends to suppress, tends to mask or get to take away the, the pain associated with it. So the best candidate for peripheral nerve stimulation will probably be somebody with injury to the nerve, either from trauma or from previous facial surgery or even from infection, who continues to have sensation in the area of pain. So it's not completely numb, it's not anesthesia dolorosa, but somebody who has a preserved sensation, maybe impaired, but still preserved, and has constant unpleasant pain in that distribution. So those patients tend to do best with peripheral neurostimulation. That's an important point. They have to have some sensation. It can't be completely absence of sensation. Because then you presumably yeah. can't- And that's for two reasons. First of all, the, uh, the, the absence of sensation usually indicates more central mechanism of injury. So that there's, there's something that not, not on the periphery. And second, if the nerve is completely non-functional and there's no sensation coming from the face, the neurostimulation is unlikely to reach the brain either. So the patient who is completely numb uh, and has no sensation in the face, putting a stimulator over the nerve is unlikely to produce any beneficial effects because it just not, doesn't, doesn't reach the centers where the processing takes place. But it's a matter of degree. Some sensation, we don't know exactly how much to define. That's and, correct. And that's and why we'll test it before we put a permanent device. You know, For most patients, before we implant a stimulator, we want to do what's called a trial of stimulation. We want to see what kind of effects this particular patient has to this approach because Talk everybody is different. Talk about that. How do the, you do that? Uh, 
Yes, the way we do that is um, we uh, we test the patients for a brief period of time, usually between uh, uh, five and ten days. They, uh, I usually do it one week, just kind of out of um, a convenience. And what I usually do, I put electrodes in, um, and the I used to test them during surgery, so I would keep patients awake, put electrode, test it on the operating table, and then I stop doing that because it's unpleasant. There's uh, there's pain from insertion, so. I prefer to either sedate or put patients to sleep completely, put electrodes, and then once they wake up in recovery room, I would turn it on because anatomical course of nerves is very predictable. So we know exactly where supraorbital, infraorbital, mandibular nerve travels. And for those nerves, we just put electrodes under X-ray or with ultrasound. And then once the patient wakes up, we turn it on. And then we actually send the patient home with electrodes literally sticking out and connected to external device. And for that week of testing, the patient is able to learn not only whether it helps their pain, but also whether or not there are any side effects associated with stimulation. They go through a variety of adjustments based on their response. And by the end of the week, we can more or less determine whether or not the patient's benefits justify implantation of permanent device. And once the permanent device is implanted, then nothing is sticking out anymore. The generator is usually in the patient's body. He or she will have a remote control that will allow them to turn it on, turn it off, make it stronger, make it weaker, switch between different programs, and, uh, or just you know keep it off if it's not needed anymore. Um, and, and, and that's kind of give patient more freedom and more autonomy, at the same time reducing risk of long-term infection or any other complications. So is, is this thing that's implanted like a giant thing sticking out of people's chest? Do they walk around with this little sign saying, look at this, I've got this horrible thing? Or is it invisible or near invisible? It's a, it's, it's a work in progress. You know, they, when this all started, they would... The generators were quite large, and patients were definitely complaining about presence of large devices that would stick on their uh, under skin of their chest. But not anymore. These days, devices are significantly smaller. They're much, much more miniaturized. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are some new devices which are investigating now, which don't have any implanted batteries at all. They're kind of externally coupled with radio frequency um, uh, sources of uh, energy sitting outside, like an earpiece or in a hat. And but those are just still work in progress. It hasn't been approved for that. But the uh, but traditional devices that we use do have an implanted battery, and it tends to go either in the chest or in the back somewhere, but away from the face. Um, and and there's just the only thing that they have in the face is essentially a set of tiny wires that travel under skin, usually with some anchors behind the ear. I mean, we surveyed our colleagues, and everybody does it slightly differently. But uh, but the principles are the same. You know, the electrodes stay over the nerve. The power source is somewhere away from the face. Are these distorting in the face? Do people have obvious wires going through their face that people see, or are they invisible? That's a great question. But no, even with, even in the old days, the electrodes uh, have always been small enough to be relatively um, uh, non-noticeable. So if, if you touch the face, you probably are able to feel small wire under the skin. But they are not expected to be either uh, visible or even palpable. So they, uh, so there are tiny wires. They are inserted through the needle. So the uh, the size of electrode is somewhere between 1.2, 1.5 millimeters. So it's a one twentieth of an inch um, uh, in diameter. So they are really thin wires with multiple contacts, and those wires allow us to deliver electricity exactly where it's needed. So uh, once this is put in. And let's say it works great. The person say this is the cat's meow, and then three months later they say, "Ah, it's not working anymore." What do you do? That's that's that happens. That happens. And and in that situation, there are several things we need to investigate. First of all, we need to make sure the device is actually working because, uh, interestingly enough, most systems we use these are rechargeable, and if you don't charge them properly, then battery just dies and stimulation stops. The second thing to test <laughs> is whether or not the um, the stimulation is getting delivered to where we need it to be. So the, the wires, it's a human body, people move, the tissues move, sometimes the electrode moves a little bit. So sometimes you have to reprogram the stimulator in order to catch the nerve again, just like you did in the beginning. And uh, and that's why majority of systems we use have multiple contacts. So we try to put the nerve somewhere in the center of the electrode, and if the electrode moves one way or another, we can just reprogram it and catch the stimulation spots again. Sometimes the, just like every man-made device, it may malfunction. It may it may disconnect, may break, may uh, um, uh, literally stop working. So those are usually easy to fix. And when we analyzed our series, 
majority of patients who needed something done to fix the device did not have to even stay in the hospital. Everything was done on an outpatient basis. And well, sometimes it, it just developed, patients developed tolerance. So they just stopped responding to this. Well, but instead of taking everything out, my preference is to turn it off, leave it off, and then start anew. And sometimes they can regain the benefits just after this short holiday of stimulation. Tell me about this reprogramming. Does the patient call you up on a telephone and you go do something on the telephone and it's reprogrammed? How do you get it reprogrammed? We're getting there. There's now a lot of work being done on trying to do remote programming via internet. You know, they, they, everything is done for that. And, uh, and the new systems definitely will have that capability. But so far, it's, it's, not, it's, it's still a work in progress. Right now, the patients need to come to my office or office of uh, their doctor of choice. And the representative from the company will come with a special programming device, usually like a tablet of sorts, and they will be able to program without any surgery, without even touching the patient, uh, but just by changing the parameters of stimulation. And there's quite a few parameters. You know, we can change effects of stimulation by increasing the amplitude, which is strength of stimulation. We can change the frequency of stimulation to make it like more rapid or more slow. We can also increase the amount of signal, the length of each signal of stimulation. So. And then there's multiple contacts. We can create multiple configurations. So we can stimulate like something as simple as plus minus, or we can do multi-contact configuration, trying to shape the field in order to get closer to the nerve or farther from side effects. Because, you know, we always have to balance between positive and negative effects. And it's, uh, it's, it's more, sometimes it's more of a science, sometimes more of art, but, uh, but inevitably people have to go through your programming because it's, it's, it would be very unusual to get hole in one just from first shot to get ideal result. Usually so we have to go through multiple reprogramming sessions and until the patient likes the, the, the simulation. So if at first you only partially succeed, you keep on working. They're kind of married yes. to the neurosurgeon who puts this in. You have to keep coming back or in some way communicating because it's, as you say, it's a work in progress. It's like changing the dose of a medicine. It's not all set from the beginning. Important. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And what we usually try to do is we try to give patient a, a several programs. So he or she can, working from home, choose between program one versus program two or alternate between them and so forth. And But inevitably, um, uh, the, there is a need for reprogramming and check. And I, I ask my patients to, to, to be um, uh, ready to come and get device checked and reprogrammed. And uh, But in all fairness, as opposed to say pumps when patients have to come every few weeks to have the pump refilled. The stimulators, once they are up and running, may not need any maintenance at all. So it's not unusual for me to see patients who I really haven't seen for quite a few years who come because the battery just stopped charging and now needs to be replaced or the battery, which is non-rechargeable, just reached the end of life and needs to be replaced. And once we change the battery, then patients disappear again and enjoy the stimulation for, for a long time. As a matter of fact, the, uh, everybody's slightly different. And I have patients who use stimulation around the clock and I have patients who turn it off and on depending on the level of pain. Some patients don't need it during the night, some other way around, don't want it during the day and want it only during the night. So, so everybody is different. And thankfully the remote controls, literally like a tiny remote controls, uh, allow them to, to adjust their stimulation based on their needs. By the way, how long do these batteries last in general? Before you need a battery change every 10 minutes or how long? <laughs> the, the rechargeable batteries usually need to be charged every week or two. So I usually instruct my patients to uh, look at the, uh, uh, find their favorite TV show and, and try to do charging during that show once a week for an hour or two. The actual device um, uh, has battery, which is much more um, uh, durable than say battery in your cell phone. I would dare to say that most batteries and cell phones will probably stop charging and holding power within three, four years. The stimulator batteries are expected these days to last somewhere between eight and 15 years. So we really, we really want patients to have as little uh, occasions to have surgery, as few surgeries as possible. So at the same time, I don't want patients to have devices that will last forever because by the time the battery needs to be changed, the technology will be so much forward. So you wouldn't want to drive 20 year old cars just because you know you don't want to go to the dealership. Explain a little bit about this recharging. You don't stick your finger into the electrical socket. How do you recharge it? No, I mean, I don't think just, just sticking your finger will, will charge your device. We'll charge probably everything else, but not the device. So the chargers uh, are actually something that is done um, uh, wirelessly, it usually get placed over the generator. The charger is a little bit bigger um, uh, device that gets that goes over clothes and uh, definitely does, does nothing to touch the skin. And it delivers energy to the generator. 
Uh, it has a set of uh, either sound or lights that tells you when it's fully charged. It usually takes about 30 to 40 minutes to charge the device to, to, to give enough power to, to, to give it enough power to last for a week or two. Okay. Um, you mentioned that there it creates a comfortable feeling that blocks the uncomfortable feeling. Any idea why that works? That's uh, you know that's something that people learned a long time ago. That you know if you if you say if something hurts and you rub it, suddenly the pain is not as severe anymore. And um, and the, the the concept behind it is what's called gate control theory of pain, which came out uh, in early 60s. There was a paper published in Nature in um, uh, in, in science, I'm sorry, and, and, the, uh, and the two neurobiologists, you know, Melzik and Wall, came up with, with, uh, um, uh, with this concept, which was initially a hypothesis, but ultimately became a theory because they have found some substrate for it in the, in the sensory processing system. And the, 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 the paradigm there is that the, uh, if you um, deliver non-painful information through the same system that normally delivers pain, that this non-painful information suppresses the pain. So as long as the patient feels this type of tingling sensation or what people call paresthesia, so it's not unpleasant like what we were talking earlier, but more of the type, light touch or some tingles in the area of pain, then the pain itself gets suppressed, gets controlled. Now you turn the stimulator off, the tingles disappear and the pain comes back. So it doesn't cure the problem, but it controls it um, uh, at the level of initial processing. So this gate control theory of pain has been kind of standard mechanism of understanding behind neuromodulation. There were many additions and changes and uh, um, uh, doubts in, in about its validity. As a matter of fact, there are some now stimulation paradigms that people don't feel. So they are what's called paresthesia-free stimulation, high-frequency bursts, there are different examples of that. But the standard stimulation that we kind of traditionally use and something we start from involves paresthesia. So we want to cover the area of pain with this non-painful sensation. And as long as we can cover it in this concordant, in a matching fashion, most likely the pain will be under control. So this sounds wonderful. And I know there are lots of people out there with constant odd feeling pain. Why is this not done more often? Well, there's several reasons for that. First of all, it doesn't work for everybody. So you have to repair that this particular patient who you, I feel would be great candidate may not necessarily respond to stimulation. But those are minority. Most of the time, the reason we don't implant patients is because uh, either they respond to medications and they are not bad enough to need surgery for this because stimulator, even though it's minor surgery, still is surgery. Part of it is also uh, has to do with the um, what's called off-label status of the devices. Most devices we use today are not designed for this particular purpose. So we use neuromodulation devices which are approved. They are approved in the United States for neuromodulation, but not for facial pain. They, we use them for spinal cord stimulation, for peripheral nerve stimulation in extremities, but not for face. So in order to do that, we have to explain to the patient that that's this kind of, not necessarily that as a matter of not experimental, but off-label uh, approach, meaning that something that is uh, legally allowed to, to be used, but not for this particular indication. Unfortunately, one of the implications of off-label status is that it may not be covered by insurance. And therefore, they, when we try to uh, justify it for insurance company to have this device tested or used in certain patients, they almost universally deny it. And we have to go through appeals and explanations in order to get this approved. But once it gets approved, uh, chances are the insurance will continue approving the battery changes over the years and uh, all the troubleshooting and so forth. But this so far is being done on an individual basis. And that's why uh, that's probably one of the main reasons why it's not being done widely. And it's kind of a neck situation because as long as we don't have approval, we can do large studies to show that it's very effective. Absence of large studies prevents it from getting formally approved. So it's kind of an ongoing struggle. Um, let me clarify. Off-label to the patient does not mean experimental. It may mean experimental to the insurance companies because you may hear that word, but it, it is a device that is approved for use in humans for implantation and has been used in humans for what? 30 years, hundreds of Even thousands longer. of times. Even so longer, it is that's not for sure. Experimental, it's just the way this thing called the Federal Drug Administration at least used to work, unless it's hydroxychloroquine, but we're not gonna talk about that. Um, um, in terms of each individual kind of use has to be studied. And unfortunately, 
or fortunately, there aren't enough patients with facial pain so that the companies can do those studies. It's not worth it to them, so they don't do it. Nothing that's absolutely bad. correct. And that's, that's exactly where we are right now. So when we get denials, the denials, usually the language of denials mentions experimental and unproven um, nature of the, of the device. And we have to kind of literally individually work with each insurance company to explain that, first of all, yes, it's not experimental. We're not doing any research. We're literally trying to help these patients. The devices have been around for a long time. The safety of devices has been shown over and over again. As a matter of fact, these devices are approved by FDA for clinical use. And the only thing that's not approved is indication. And the indication is something that in order to be approved, you have to show the large study that where, where it was tested and, and uh, shown to be effective. And we just don't have those studies. So, um, uh, and the people say also say about new technology and new, new approach. And I have to show them papers from 1960s showing that electrical neuromodulation was first time used in 1962 in California when people implanted electrodes around mandibular nerves specifically to control neuropathic pain. So this is definitely not new. I mean, something that's been around oh, for almost 60 years. Ben Franklin knew that if he shocked himself, Ben Franklin knew if he shocked himself with lightning afterwards, he felt really good for a while. <laughs> it goes even further. As a matter of fact, the, the history of neuromodulation goes back to to Roman Empire, you know, the people use torpedo fish to treat migraines and gout. And torpedo fish elicits electrical shots, you know, as you put your foot in the water with that uh, stingray there, you actually get a little bit of electrical stings that controls the pain. So that's usually usually is um, described as a first example of electrical neuromodulation in clinical practice. It's been published. Scribonius Largus was this physician of Roman court who actually published all that. So this is definitely not new. There's nothing new under the sun. So if we thought about something, somebody thought about this before us. <laughs> um, that reminds me of what Peter Janetta used to say, is that old surgeons have to read new books and new surgeons have to read old books to learn everything. Okay, um, MRIs. There's an issue with MRIs with this device because these are electrical wires and MRIs mess with it or not? Uh, most MRIs will be very reluctant to do the study on these devices. And even those devices which are approved for MRI uh, will have this conditional um, uh, label, uh, which will mention that the device has to be implanted within the spinal column on these levels and so forth. So anecdotally, I have patients with implanted uh, facial uh, trigeminal stimulators which have MR had MRIs and were perfectly fine and safe. And I have pictures to show, uh, but MRI centers will be reluctant to do that. Now, interestingly enough, there's a device which is fully MRI approved for both 1.5 and three Tesla scanners. It's one of those wireless devices, um, but, but that's something that we don't routinely use just yet. There's a study underway specifically for facial pain indications. If that turns out to be uh, positive, then my guess the patients will be more open to this particular device for reasons of MRI compatibility. Oh, but but gotta keep in mind, no, MR, no device that has any kind of metal is considered MRI safe. What, what the, the labeling we have for this device is called MRI conditional. So essentially they have certain conditions when MRI is known to be safe or harmless to the patient and to the device. Uh, and everything on the market now from pacemakers to spinal cord stimulators to brain stimulators, they have this conditional approval. So we're trying to get the same thing for peripheral stimulators. And once again, it requires larger clinical experience to show this. So right. there are some devices which are definitely cleared and there's the, something that will take a little bit longer to get cleared. The MRI has to be done with certain parameters. They can adjust these parameters. They do adjust them with each study, and they have to be aware of what parameters are apparently safe with these devices. That's right. That's very true. And and the other thing is what, what some of the patients uh, become confused about is they feel like, oh, this device is approved for 1.5 Tesla MRI, then I can definitely have an open MRI with 0.3 Tesla because it has lower power. That's uh, actually a misconception because for to have the same degree of quality of pictures, you, they have to increase what's called radio frequency coil around the head or by the body part. So lower Tesla MRIs may actually have more energy delivered to the patient. So you have to be prepared for that. So but, but in general, the radiologists are pretty good about that. They read the labels. They know exactly which company, which device is approved for what kind of settings. And they would probably be go along with, with recommended settings. Um, people are concerned if they walk around and they come in contact or close to some kind of electrical high-powered field that it will wreak havoc with their device. Do you have any comments on that? 
Yes, that's, that's, that's another very, um, uh, very interesting point because I tell my patient that they shouldn't stick their head into microwave because microwave will definitely absorb the, um, uh, the, the, the rays into the electrical like device and metal. Uh, but in general, everything else is considered safe. The older generation of devices was very sensitive to magnets. So patients would go through metal detector in the uh, exiting a drugstore or big supermarket and the device would get turned off. And that was very easy to fix. All they need to do is just to pull out the remote control and turn it back on. And I had a patient who uh, came to me because the device uh, uh, got depleted early and we found that it was turned on and off uh, many thousand times, which was very difficult for a patient to do. So it turns out that he had a lot, lot big collection of magnets on his refrigerator. And every time he would open the refrigerator, he would turn his device off and then turn it back on. And it was like, it was very it was comical situation, but but every time this happens, I have to I have to investigate this. So yeah, so the was a shunt who came to me with constant change in settings because her husband was working in the, in the auto store and they had huge magnet that would lift up the cars. And every time she would go to his auto shop, the entire shunt will change the settings. So so there's there's very unusual situations happening, and it's interesting how the, how they. Um, the uh, is it doesn't yeah. give them a surge of electricity. It just turns it off. That's correct. Yeah, the device doesn't explode. It doesn't stop working. But most uh, stimulators we implant today have this magnetic switch that will turn them off. And it's done for safety. So when they go for surgery, for example, they can put a magnet on their device and that would turn them off temporarily. So that's. I, uh, say, uh, I did have a patient who lived in the cornfields of Iowa and there was a, an electrical storm. Lightning struck his house and it zapped the whole system. It stopped working. <laughs> Can happen. Yes, if the patient gets electrocuted, my guess the electrical device will absorb quite a bit of power because it's metal. So let me switch to talk about pain in the back of the head. This thing called occipital neuralgia. If you want to talk about that? I'll leave it as an open question. What is? Oh yes, absolutely. The occipital neuralgia is a very it's a fascinating condition. You know, it's a, even though the name is similar to trigeminal neuralgia, it's a very different thing. And it can be unilateral or bilateral. It tends to be from uh, some kind of dysfunction of occipital nerves. It may happen in patients with abnormalities at craniocervical junction when nerves are literally get irritated, sometimes from trauma, sometimes from no reason at all. So there's a case of idiopathic occipital neuralgia, which we never find out what's caused them in the first place. But, but those patients can be as miserable as facial pain patients. And this constant pain in the occiput in the back of the head on one side or both sides can be quite disabling. And the treatment of that condition has traditionally been the same barbaric approach when the nerves get cut or the roots of the nerves get cut or the gangway gets removed um, and so uh, so the, the alternative of uh, nerve stimulation uh, became uh, uh, more of the um, mainstream back in the late 1990s one of our colleagues in uh, texas came with this idea of putting electrode over the nerves and stimulating that nerve and by doing that controlling the pain and it worked and it worked so well that there was a lot of studies and papers published on this to the point that uh, a few years ago, there was even guidelines published by our neurosurgical organization, specifically spelling out that occipital nerve stimulation has enough evidence to be to support treatment of occipital neuralgia. So that publication of guidelines actually made it much easier for us to get approval from insurance companies because electrical stimulation. Maybe is, you, but um, in general, it's still a problem. It's still a problem. It definitely is. Definitely is. It's still, no insurance company has it approved as accepted indication. So we have to argue every single case. The insurance companies tend to like to use the word headache. And they say that we're treating headache. This frightens the insurance company. They don't want people to be able to treat headache with electrical devices because there's a huge population of patients in the world with headache and they don't want to unleash it. That's that's part of it. Another part of it, correct? For occipital neuralgia, yes, we recommended using specifically for occipital neuralgia. You see, there were some studies on using occipital stimulation for migraines, and those were not as um, uh, successful. So it worked for quite a few patients, but didn't work for a majority. So we would we we'll stop advocating it for actual migraines until we come up with some new paradigms. But for occipital neuralgia, which is a very specific condition, it's not a headache. It's very a neuropathic pain in the occipital nerve distribution. It may respond to occipital nerve blocks, doesn't have to, but usually does. Um, it, it doesn't go over the entire head, it follows the occipital nerve. A bit more. Explain what you mean by occipital nerve blocks. Yes, the nerve blocks uh, is, 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 uh, is both 
diagnostic and therapeutic modality. So something we use to diagnose the condition and also to control the symptoms. And uh, the nerve blocks literally involve injection of medication in the vicinity of the nerve. And we're blocking the nerve because we're delivering local anesthetic. Usually just anesthetic sometimes <coughs> with or without steroids. But that's done, first of all, to document the involvement of each particular nerve. And second, to uh, uh, to, to see how the, um, uh, the, 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 the production of numbness uh, have, uh, uh, translates into patient's outcome. So some patients may hate sensation of numbness and they would not like it. And those patients will not be good candidate for any nerve cutting procedure. They may still respond great to occipital nerve stimulation because it does not make them numb. But if the patient does not really respond to block, then, um, then the question is, is that the right nerve? Do we need to find some other nerve that's responsible for their pain? And that will be the nerve that we need to stimulate. So I do nerve blocks routinely for patients, first of all, to prepare them, to, to make them understand. And also for me to be more comfortable with the idea that I'm operating on, on the right um, uh, substrate. But the nerve block is outpatient procedure, something that does not require incisions, is done with a needle, just essentially the skin gets cleaned and then skin anesthetized with tiny local anesthetic and then a little bit bigger needle, bigger anesthetic is injected closer to the nerve, not into the nerve, but in the vicinity of the nerve. The effects of nerve blocks are temporary. The numbness goes away within a few hours as soon as local anesthetic wears off, but the effects on pain can be quite lasting. So the, the good effect of the, of the nerve block is usually considered a good screening test. It doesn't rule out patients who are candidates for simulator, but gives them a little bit more assurance that's the right thing to try. And if they get temporary benefit from this, um, then you just go ahead and put in the device or do you do a, a test uh, like you did with the peripheral stimulation to see if it works before the permanent implant? Right now I do the test. I still try the test because first of all, I want to um, prepare the patient to what the stimulation feels, make sure that he or she likes the effects of stimulation and also to see how much it helps their pain. Because like, like we talked about earlier, sometimes even most um, uh, confident uh, and most uh, uh, patients with highest expectations may have no results at all. And I want to make sure the patient does respond and his pain, her pain does improve with stimulation. Usually one week is enough to get that understanding. And once we have this, then I feel much better justifying placement of permanent device. Now we call it permanent, nothing is permanent, but it's a much longer lasting device with an internal generator. Yeah, not permanent. Talk about, let's switch to spinal or brainstem stimulation. Yes, it's interesting because for facial pain, the, um, uh, we can stimulate spinal cord to control the pain. What happens is that the trigeminal nerve, which most of our patients are familiar with the concept of trigeminal nerve, starts in the face, goes in the ganglion, ganglion is kind of just next to the ear, behind the eye, and from there it goes into the brainstem. Now, interestingly enough, the trigeminal fibers in the brainstem go all the way down into spinal cord, and then from there they go into the thalamus and cortex. So this area of the spinal cord where trigeminal nucleus lives, it's called nucleus caudalis or kind of towards the tail. Uh, this nucleus happens to be at the level of first and second vertebral bones. So when we stimulate spinal cord at a very high cervical level, we can actually cover the entire face or most of the lateral aspect of the face. And, the, uh, and this, this is, has been a tried uh, for treatment of facial pain. Uh, it was uh, tried in, in, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and all over the world. And the results are interesting. Um, and, uh, and the only reason we don't rush to spinal cord stimulation in this is because if we can get the same results with much less invasive peripheral stimulation, that, that's considered the first choice. But the spinal cord stimulation has been around for a longer time. As a matter of fact, it's probably easier to get approval for this, uh, but it's, it is somewhat more invasive intervention. So, but, but traveling further, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the advantage of neuromodulation is that it can be applied to all, the entire pathway of pain. And it starts at periphery, it goes into the gangrene, through the nerve root, into the brainstem, into the thalamus, into the cortex. And every, every spot can be treated with neuromodulation. So we can put electrodes over the nerves, we can put electrodes over the ganglion, we can stimulate the nerve root, we can stimulate the uh, upper cervical spinal cord, we can stimulate the thalamus. We have deep brain stimulation approaches for stimulation of thalamus, and we can stimulate the cortex. Now, just like with everything else, you have to find the right spot for stimulation. So sensory cortex, where the stimulation is processed, the stimulation of sensory cortex will probably make people numb or, or create more pain. 
So what people discovered is that the stimulation of motor cortex, which is the next uh, uh, part of the brain, more anterior, more towards the forehead, control, is able to control the pain. And the facial pain, including the apprentation facial pain, like anesthesia dolorosa or pain after strokes, that seems to be a good uh, indication for motor cortex stimulation. Now, you are much bigger expert in this field than me. I mean, I, 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 I'm trained on your papers and I know how much experience you have, but, but I feel very comfortable offering to my patients because I think that's a great modality for very specific indications. And once again, it's an alternative to destructive surgery. So for patients with anesthesia dolorosa, the only thing I can offer them will be either mortal cortex stimulation or trigeminal tractotomy, which is much bigger, much more invasive, much more destructive intervention. More so less. for me, motor cortex stimulation is generally tried first. I think it's much more uh, um, uh, forgiving. It's definitely more uh, better tolerated by patients. The risk uh, profile is much better. So I feel like motor cortex stimulation is probably the first step in this situation. Now, going even further, you can stimulate all other parts of the brain as well. And uh, the general trend these days actually is away from surgeons like me and you and more towards non-invasive neuromodulation which is something that people try with magnetic stimulation, direct current stimulation, and we read more and more about this. Unfortunately, there's not that much done for treatment of facial pain, but there's plenty of literature for treatment of migraines, for treatment of psychiatric conditions, treatment of um, pretty much everything. Um, and maybe facial pain will be part of it as well at some point. Now, right now, majority of patients with neuromodulation is applied use invasive modalities. Tell people what that's called again when you you do external stimulation of the brain that's called? There's, there's two ways. One is called transcranial magnetic stimulation or RTMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. The other one is called TDCS, trans, uh, transcranial direct current stimulation or cortical, direct cortical stimulation. So the uh, uh, TMS magnetic stimulation um, uh, involves magnetic field. So there's like figure of eight type of coils that are put on the head very actively now being investigated for treatment of depression. And DCS or direct current stimulation kind of stimulates directly electrically over the spots with one or multiple waveguides. Um, and that is used for everything from gaming to any kind of uh, uh, cognitive dysfunction uh, to pain. But it, it, I understand it's approved when psychiatrists do transcranial magnetic stimulation for depression. That is an approved... It is, it is. In psychiatrists have it in their offices, yes, and they use it, and uh, it usually requires multiple sessions, so the patients have to come either daily or weekly for a long period of time, uh, but it's definitely um, it's definitely approved, uh, and it's now being considered as one of the alternatives to electroconvulsive therapy, because essentially it's electrical modulation of the brain, yes. but with much less um, uh, degree of invasiveness. And certainly patients with severe facial pain are depressed, so that there's a possibility it might help them too. That's for sure. But I think the best thing for depression in patients with facial pain is to control their pain. So if we can control their pain, some of them will, will get rid of their depression too. And, and interestingly, the site that they treat for depression is very close to the site that we treat with motor cortex stimulation. So if you can get the psychiatrist to move that device just a little, it's right over the spot. It's uh, potentially helpful in determining whether someone might be a candidate for motor cortex stimulation if you do uh, trials of uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation and they benefit from it with their pain. That's There's correct. A, As a matter of fact, our colleagues in France, they were using magnetic stimulation as a screening for motor cortex stimulation. They found those who did it, they actually fared better. I haven't tried this yet. You know, when I was doing all these initial investigations, you know, TMS was not widely approved and uh, uh, accessible. But right now, I think there's nothing wrong with people trying it first. Um, and, and if it works, then perhaps we can find better screening tools. Um, people find all kinds of things on the internet. Are there any devices that you know of that are being commercially put out that people can try that are worth a dollar, $20, or whatever hundreds of dollars that they end up paying for these devices that they purchase? Nothing yet, you know, not for facial pain. I do recommend use of special supraorbital stimulator for migraine. Uh, there is non-invasive device that people put on the forehead. Um, and I don't want to put any commercial names, but you can look it up easily. It's a special device that gets applied to the forehead for treatment of migraines. It's actually approved by insurances. It's FDA approved in the United States. So it's, it's something that uh, people use quite frequently. 
Um, uh, but for facial pain, um, there is a lot of research being done, and maybe one day we'll be able to promote some of them through our um, uh, investigations, through our publications, and so forth. Right now, the, um, I pretty much leave the uh, choice of device to the implanting physician. I ask my colleagues to discuss with patients pros and cons of every device, because each of the devices on the market has certain benefits and certain disadvantages. And we have to be able to kind of balance them based on the patient's um, uh, individual needs. Uh, some devices are smaller, some are smarter, some are uh, more MRI compatible, some have more electrode options. And I think that's all taken in consideration. You know, with you, uh, I like, like you, I have patients coming from all over the country and I can see that in certain geographic locations, there's preference from one company, in certain there's another one. But ultimately, they all, nothing is perfect. Each has pros and cons. And, um, and realistically, uh, if device works for you, for this, for this or that patient, that's the best device he or she can have. Let me ask, uh, this might be from left field, so to speak, stem cell therapy. Any comment on stem cell therapy? For uh, the short answer is no, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think there will be some um, a way for us to integrate stem cell therapy into pretty much every disease process because, you know, the idea of regeneration, idea of recovery is very attractive. But I don't think anything people are using today has enough evidence for me to, 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 to promote to my patients. The regenerative approach in general makes perfect sense. But in most patients with facial pain that I'm seeing, I don't even know what needs to be regenerated. So for me to recommend any kind of stem cell treatment, I wouldn't even know where to inject, what kind of cells to use, no, what I to agree. look for other than pain control. So I think there's plenty of potential, like with any stem cell uh, uh, treatment, but I don't think there's anything ready to be used right now. Uh, you're right, a paper in the New England Journal said, hold on for 10 more years before you even take a breath. Um, before I turn it over to Ali for the questions from the audience, I'm sure there are a lot, I'll let you say whatever you want to say that I didn't ask about. Something I didn't ask about that you want to say. Oh, thank you very much. I think what, what's important to know is that the, um, uh, the, the, the reason we have so many different surgeries for treatment of facial pain uh, is, first of all, that there are different kinds of facial pain. And every patient has very unique uh, set of features. So we have different classifications and we have several algorithms of how to use one modality versus the other for each particular indication. But, uh, but the, I think the worst thing the patients can have is just to uh, 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 dive into some dogma that, oh, I have trigeminal neurology and therefore this and this and this works for me. I think, I think they, they, they work together with a specialist who can uh, help you differentiate different conditions who may, will make a lot of difference in your eventual treatment. The other thing I want to say is that there's a reason why we have so many treatments, successful treatments, is because none of the treatments work every time. So there's always, uh, an, uh, uh, there should be some contingency plan. And if one modality doesn't work, the patient and the doctor need to keep in mind that there must be something else that they, they, they would consider next. Absolutely, I always say, don't go to a doctor who has one thing that he does better than anybody, go to the doctor who does many things because not everything works perfect. I interrupted, I apologize. No, 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 I fully agree. I think I think that was that was a good summary of what I wanted to say. Thank you. Ali, have we confused people? Are there specific questions that we can there are a lot of questions. Um, first question, pretty basic. Who is going to do this surgery? And is it only done at major hospitals or is your local doctor going to be able to do it? Well, I think eventually every doctor will be able to do it, but right now it is, it is a question of expertise. We, we investigated that among ourselves and our colleagues and we did confirm that more experienced person has, less complications they observe. So there's there's definitely a learning curve when you do first patient or second patient, and somebody will have to be that first patient for every doctor. But you don't want to be that first patient. So they, so you want to go to a place which has experience, which can share their track record in terms of success and in terms of complications. And it doesn't have to be university. There's plenty of private centers that have huge experience in treatment of facial pain. And there may be some universities who have no experience in that at all. So that that doesn't really match. In general, yes. I think when you look for a doctor who does it, you can start from your primary uh, pain specialist, neurologist, family doctor, 
he or she probably will know a reputation of other physicians in the community and they can say that this doctor has more experience, this doctor has um, a particular interest in facial pain and so forth. I think finding doctors and openly asking them about their experience will make more sense. I think the patients need to be aware of the fact that experience varies from person to person. And ultimately, if, if the place specializes in certain uh, uh, direction, like if they really deal with a lot of patients with facial pain, most likely they will have um, uh, enough clinical experience to judge about the appropriateness of candidates, about best choice of surgical intervention, about what to look for in terms of complications and troubleshooting and so forth. But it's not uncommon for patients to get to the place which may not be necessarily experienced and then come to more experienced center for troubleshooting. So I'm sure Dr. Brown and myself, we see patients coming from all over with either very successful or completely unsuccessful stories. And it's not uncommon for us to go back to scratch and kind of try to establish diagnosis, try to use common and standard approaches before jumping to something unusual. All right, awesome. Um, when you're going to um, speak with the doctor, is there anything that you should be asking them discussing neuromodulation? Like, do you want to know their success rate? Do you want to know how many they're doing a year? What should a patient ask? Yes, absolutely. This is more of the common sense uh, recommendations. Yes, you should ask patients and the doctors about their experience and their attitude toward this. I mean, if you feel that the doctor is completely negative about this, perhaps based on his or her experience, then you know that you're not going to be a good candidate for that in this particular facility. If the doctor is overly optimistic, that will be concerning too, because the, like we discussed earlier, nothing works all the time. So patients have to be very um, realistic and pragmatic about this. You know, things may work, may not. It's definitely worth trying. It's definitely worth testing, but you have to prepare that it may not work. And if it doesn't work immediately, it may still work later and so forth. So there's there's certain um, uh, level of tolerance uh, and there's also a certain level of trust. You know, you if you find a doctor who you trust in terms of his or her experience and his way to deliver information to you, then I think your overall outcome will be better. I have to add that I once had a patient recently who asked their first physician, what is his success rate with this operation? And he said, 100%. And they turned and left the operating room, left the, left the office because no one has 100% success. That's not a good thing to say. Well, I think what, what you need to have, it's a follow-up question, but how many have you done? Because if you only done one and it's well, successful, yes, it is 100%. But it doesn't mean that the, 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 it will stay 100% in the future. So, you know, I, I when I teach doctors, I tell them that, you know, I give talk on complications, for example. And I tell them, you know what, every complication will eventually happen. And if you haven't had it, because it's not because you're too good. It's just because you just haven't done enough. At some point, you will have these things. And the, the, the safest person is not the one who doesn't have complications. The safest person is who knows how to manage those complications, how to diagnose them and how to troubleshoot them and how to get out of them when they happen. So yes, we want to prevent complications, we want to minimize this, but we also want to be prepared, not just us, but our patients and our uh, extenders. We have nurse practitioners, we have residents, we have physician assistants who will be familiar with that, who will not just blow the patient away, but who will bring them in when it's needed, get things done in a um, you know, rapid fashion and, and solve the problem and get, make them happy again. If, if I can chime in, I think that's an extraordinarily important point. There was a study done of university hospitals versus smaller facilities, and everybody had the same complication rate. The university hospital had the same complication rate. What was different was what they did when they identified and how quickly they identified that complication. That's where character comes in. That's the most important thing in a surgeon, is how do they deal with the problem, because the problems will occur. I'm sorry to give a speech, but that's very important. I fully agree. Another question, there was a little bit of confusion on which types of facial pain um, neuromodulation is good for. Um, does it only work for tri trigeminal neuralgia? You guys talked about occipital neuralgia, but is it, if someone has different types of facial pain, or is this a candidate, are they a candidate for this? You know what, it's, it's not surprising people ask this question because we hear the same question from our colleagues as well. The, what we know for sure is that we do not recommend neuromodulation for trigeminal neurology. Like we talked in the beginning, the typical trigeminal neurology is not a good indication for neuromodulation. However, having said all this, we do have patients who had trigeminal neurology 
but who develop neuropathic pain over time as a result of treatment, as a result of complications, as a result of failures, as a result of natural progression. There's different reasons why people may develop neuropathy. And for those patients, neuromodulation may be an option. It's occipital neurology is very different condition. Occipital neurology, even though it sounds like trigeminal, it's a very different one. It doesn't respond to the same medications. It doesn't come from the same nerve. It has very different pattern of pain. So, and it's, I mean, as physicians, we are guilty of having these similar names for very different conditions. But keep in mind, trigeminal neurology or tic dolorosa is very unique condition that really has very few analogs in any other part of the body. So occipital neurology is like neurology in the arm or leg or posterpedic neurology, something over constant pain related to nerve irritation. The trigeminal neurology is a very different animal. So for occipital neurology, it's almost like trigeminal neuropathic pain. Those are good indications for neuromodulation. Okay. After you do the surgery, the neuromodulation, how long does it take to feel like that it's working? You said you don't turn it on until the patient wakes up, but how long after the procedure will the patient feel relief? That varies from person to person. I mean, sometimes patients experience pain relief immediately as the device gets turned on. Those are unfortunately rare cases, and we love when this happens, but we are not expecting this every time. Most of the time, the device has to ramp up, and the patient has to get used to stimulation. And as they get used to the sensation that stimulation provides, they also notice that pain is not there anymore. So that may take from a few minutes to a few hours, sometimes a few days. Sometimes, you know, I have patients who really had good relief from the trial, from the testing, and then when permanent device got in, it wasn't as effective, and they come back and say, you know what, it didn't work for me, take it out, and I try to tell them, wait a little bit longer. And in a few weeks, sometimes in a few months, it actually does produce quite a bit of difference. So there are different conditions that have different uh, interval for um, uh, pain relief to occur. There are certain things uh, that are expected to start working only like two, four to six weeks uh, later. Uh, for trigeminal neuropathic pain, we usually see improvement within a few days. That's have been our experience. With motor cortex stimulation that we briefly discussed earlier, it may take longer. It may take a while for, for whatever reason, brain reorganizes itself for patients to feel some improvement in pain. So don't, don't create rigid deadlines. I tell my patients, don't expect things to be improved by tomorrow or by next week. Be open-minded about this. Let's see how things go. We'll learn this together. And once, once we're confident that it's working well and we don't need to help each other anymore, then you can continue living your normal life. And if at some point both you and I agree that it doesn't work, I will have no problems taking it out. You see, that one of the advantages of neuromodulation, which we didn't really touch about today, is that it can be removed. I mean, I have removed devices from patients either because it didn't work or sometimes because pain went away. And when pain goes away and they have not been using device for more than six months, I have no problems taking it out. So, and it was when we first time discovered that this can happen, we were so happy that we discovered something new. Turns out it was described in literature. They have the fact that peripheral stimulators were removed because pain went away was described back in 1970s. So things happen. And I always try to be optimistic and tell the patients, you know, if it stops hurting and we don't need it anymore, we'll take it out and we'll be done and over with. I'm going to interrupt on this optimistic note because Dr. Slavin has not stopped talking for the full 60 minutes. Give him a deep breath. I believe if you have more questions, you can forward them to the Facial Pain Association and we will see that you can get appropriate responses. And I would like to conclude by saying that I thank the Board of uh, Directors of the organization for making it possible for us to do this. I'd like to thank Dr. Slavin as a member of the Medical Advisory Board and all our members of volunteers. This is an organization that could use your support. And I encourage you, please, if you thought this was helpful, please support the organization so we can continue to give you information. And I wish you all good night and good health. Thank you. Thank you.